So I'm going to do um, a signal test, uh, hoping that the signal is good. And if the signal is good, then on Sunday, we'll be able to do a social anxiety seminar. Will we not? We will. For I will it. Now I will sit here and wait for you to tell me whether the signal is clear or not, and then I will delete this afterwards. Uh, you can do that with the YouTube Live. You can say very absurd things in the beginning and very absurd things at the end, and you can just cut them out and pretend you didn't say them. When people say, he said some strange, some strange things there, you say, no, I didn't. It wasn't me. You gaslight everybody. Yes. How is it? Clear, super clear, 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 clear. If it does become unclear or I start to buffer, um, please leave a comment and please tell me afterwards. Um, now then, let us discuss the inner critic. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the year of our Lord, 2023. 2,023 years since our Lord Yeshua, the Christos, was born Ed, in Palestine, a lovely little Palestinian fellow from Galilee. Please open your Bibles to page Pete Walker, shrinking the inner critic in complex PTSD and low did he say. Please listen. In my work with clients repetitively traumatized in childhood, I'm continuously struck by how frequently the various thought processes of the inner critic trigger them into overwhelming emotional flashbacks. This is because the PTSD derived inner critic weds shame and self-hate about imperfection to fear of abandonment and mercilessly drives the psyche with the entwined serpents of perfectionism and endangerment, the entwined serpents of perfectionism and endangerment. Recovering individuals must learn to recognize, confront, and disidentify from the many inner critic processes that tumble them back in emotional time, not real time, emotional time, to the awful feelings of overwhelming fear, self-hate, hopelessness, and self-disgust that were part and parcel of their original childhood abandonment. Look, I know it's a heavy subject. I know it's tough. I know having CPTSD is tough. Having a rough childhood is rough. But I can make it easier by reading everything as though it were written by Geoffrey Chaucer. <laughs> Psychogen I won't. Psychogenesis, but I'll spare you a Scouse accent. Psychogenesis of the PTSD critic, a flashback-inducing critic, is typically spawned in a danger-laden childhood home. When parents do not provide safe enough bonding and attachment, I can't even say these words in a Scouse accent, it doesn't work. The child flounders, so a flashback-inducing critic is spawned in a danger-laden childhood home. When parents do not provide safe enough bonding and attachment, the child flounders in abandonment, fear, and depression. So even the child begins to give up and become depressed. Many children appear to be hardwired to adapt to this endangering abandonment with perfectionism. If you're wondering why you suffer from all that procrastination, it's typically born of perfectionism. And it's, as Pete Walker says, it's um, an adaptation to the endangering abandonment. Endangering because the biological level, if your parents abandon you, you could, if we still lived in the wilderness, you would, you would die. This is true for both the passive abandonment of neglect and the active abandonment of abuse. And typically when we think of childhood trauma, you think of something, one, one would think of something active, something bad is happening to the child by an active participant, but neglect also does it. Neglect also does it. This is true for both the passive, not active, the passive abandonment of neglect and the active abandonment of abuse. So where things actually are being done to the child. A prevailing climate of danger forces the maturing superego to cultivate the very house, 
Psychodynamics of Perfectionism and Endangerment, listed at the end of this article. I'll post the article. I won't read it all. Um, when anxious perfectionist efforting, however, fails over and over to render the parents safe and loving. Let me say that again. When your anxious perfectionist efforting, he's turned effort into a verb, your efforting fails over and over again to render the parents safe and loving, you're not giving the parents what you think they want and their behavior isn't changing despite your best efforts. The inner critic, that is the toxic super ego we've been discussing recently, it's just another word for it, it's exactly the same thing, becomes increasingly hypervigilant and hostile in its striving to ferret out the shortcomings that seemingly alienate the parents. Like the soldier overlong in combat, PTSD sets in and locks the child into hypervigilance and excessive sympathetic nervous system arousal. Not of the good kind, unfortunately. Desperate to relieve the anxiety and depression of abandonment, the critic-driven child searches the present and the future for all the ways he is too much or not enough. The child's nascent ego finds no room to develop and her identity virtually becomes the superego. That's a hard sentence. That's a hard sentence. You'll start tuning out if, if, I, if I don't explain that. So uh, the soldier overlying a combat where PTSD sets in and locks the child into hypervigilance. You've got that, I'm sure. Excessive sympathetic nervous system arousal occurs. You've got that, I'm sure. Desperate to relieve the anxiety and depression of abandonment. So the, the child is living with a baseline level of anxiety and depression from ab of, of abandonment. The inner critic driven child searches the present and the future for all the ways in which he's too much or not enough. So now the, the superego, the inner critic, has, has taken over and has almost become the ego itself. So these injunctions are now invading and, and, and smashing down the boundaries of the, of the ego space, which is probably one of the contributing factors to us feeling like, well, I don't really have a self as such to make choices and, and, and good decisions from. I don't feel like I can want anything because the superego is there so powerfully driving everything that's going on. Now, a superego injunction is not a want. A superego injunction is a demand that was delivered from an external source that's now being internalized. This is getting a bit heady. I feel it. I feel the headiness, man. And breathe into the body. Align the chakras. The child's nascent ego finds no room to develop in the space where the child should be developing a sense of self. The ego, we discussed this the other day. For Freud, uh, there was the, he didn't say ego. He said, ich. Not in a scout way. He said it in a German way. It just happens to be the same way. Ich, which is I in German. And then the superego was the über ich, the over I. So where the ich, the ego, the self should be growing, in fact, what's happening is there's no room to develop and her identity virtually becomes the superego. So the only thing that's left is the superego, which is what we're calling the inner critic. So instead of an identity with wants and desires and fears and dreams and boundaries and everything else, there is just the uh, tyrannical, toxic superego uh, replaying uh, impossible to fulfill um, hyper perfectionism inducing demands. These are called superego injunctions. In the process, the critic often becomes virulent and eventually switches to the first person when goading the child. So the inner voice will stop saying in the second person, it would say, you're such a loser. It now says, back to Pete Walker, I'm such a loser. I'm so pathetic, bad, ugly, worthless, stupid, defective. One of my clients griefully remembered the constant refrains of his childhood. If only I wasn't so needy and selfish. If only my freckles would fade. If only I could pitch a perfect game. If only I could stop gagging on the canned peas during dinner. If only I could pray all the time to get mom, mom's, American, mom's arthritis cured, then maybe she'd stop picking on me and then maybe dad would play catch with me. 
If you want to read the full article, go to petewalker.com and it's called Shrinking the Inner Critic. He has great books. Uh, the Tao of Fully Feeling is a great book. My favorite is Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving. Stephanie Kaplowitz, what's that? Super ego. So you have an ego. So imagine there's a, a holy trinity, as it were. So you have um, the id. This is Freudian psychoanalytic theory. The id, all the childish um, impulses, um, wild, um, basic, primitive. Above that, you have the ego, which is your sense of self, the boundary between you and others, the boundary between you and reality if it's functioning, if it was allowed to develop properly. And above the ego, we have the super ego, the over ego. And that what that does is it's a recording device. I'm painting with broad brushstrokes here. It's a recording device to take on the instructions that were given to the child in childhood to say, this is good, this is bad. Do do that. Do do that. Don't do that. You're going to do that. You do do that. And you don't do that. This is good. This is bad. So it should function as a kind of guidance system or a conscience or a morality if the child was raised in a good enough, fairly healthy environment. If the child was raised in an environment of active abuse, like bad things were done to the child, or passive abuse, the child was neglected, the superego internalizes, and the fancy way of saying that is introjects, introjects, internalizes the messages. Now, the messages could be an abusive father saying, you're such a stupid girl, or the father ignores you and you internalize the message. He didn't say you're such a stupid girl, or I don't love you, or you're worthless. Just by ignoring you, you internalize, you interject the behavior as I am unlovable, or I am not worthy of attention, or I am not worthy of care. So that's the superego. That's what it does. It internalizes the messages we receive from authority figures in childhood and then it replays them. It's a very, very good uh, recording and replay device where it has no quality control whatsoever. Is there a correlation between ADHD and CPTSD? I think that CPTSD <clears throat> is the root cause of nearly all mental health issues and personality disorders, except where they've come from a biological factor or a, a damage and injury or drugs, drug usage, or, which obviously includes alcohol. Annie Walker says, your course on dealing with emotional flashbacks, then both of Pete Walker's books has practically eliminated these voices. Thank you very much, Annie. Appreciate that. Uh, they're great books by Pete Walker. Highly recommend them. Is it kind of like split personality? Um, it, it can be it, it can be experienced subjectively as that it wouldn't be classed by a psychiatrist as dissociative identity disorder because there'd be different um, diagnostic criteria that would need it to be fulfilled. The person may feel themselves to be going um, crazy and going psychotic because the voices uh, will appear at times to be you talking and telling you terrible things about yourself, but it can also feel very invasive. It can feel like an alien voice or the voice of um, an enemy, an evil spirit telling you you're just a terrible person. So it, it isn't a dissociative identity disorder, no, but it could be experienced as that, like the client might report that they feel like they, they've got multiple people living inside of them. Amy asks, if a, nar if a narcissist, if a narcissist parent screws up a child and they become one too? No, no, not necessarily. The conditions, I will do a proper video on this, but not today. I'll probably rent a studio for it because it's important. The conditions for creating a full-blown narcissistic personality disorder child are quite specific and they're quite unusual. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen at the drop of a hat. Um, and no, being raised by a narcissistic parent doesn't necessarily induce, doesn't necessarily create a narcissistic child. I will drink now.
You don't need to hear that. Is the Gulag guard this guy? I don't know what that means. What about an inner critic without sound? Well, uh, you would experience that typically as emotional flashbacks. So you would, you would, and the inner critic can induce emotional flashbacks. The inner critic is enforcing interjected uh, messages and people. So you have avatars, simulated avatars of people, simulated avatars of their uh, fundamental messaging, and that messaging can actually push you in a certain direction and it will induce emotional flashbacks, yes. What if I have anxiety in a situation of emotional flashback, but the inner critic is silent? That's quite common. That's quite common. Um, you might not hear the inner critic being activated when you're in an emotional flashback because I said the inner critic is, um, is just a recording and replay device with no quality control. It has no ambitions. It has no objectives. But the internalized people, the introjected people in the messages that they're giving you, they do have objectives. And you have understood from a very young age what those objectives are. And some of those objectives could be fairly horrendous. They could be ruined. They could be, for example, just ruin your life. Never be better than me. Never be bigger than me. Ruin your own life. So if you're having anxiety, that they might just sit back and go, well, my job is done here. You know, because now you're not going to get this job or now you're not going to be able to flourish and thrive in the way you would be able to um, without this this anxiety or this emotional flashback um so that that's why i'm i'm banging on about this at the moment it's pretty important it can keep you in abusive it will keep you in abusive narcissistically abusive relationships if you don't deal with that any helpful advice for uh, what a fantastic avatar that's one of my favorite actors doing his favorite role it's javier bardem playing Anton Chigurh in No Country for Old Men. It's a great movie. It's a great book. Read the book, watch the movie, good adaptation, all good. Um, yeah, I have a book full of uh, advice, helpful advice for Echo Codependence. It's called A Cult of One, and it's available from Jeff Bezos' Slave Mansion um, right now. And uh, essentially what that book tries to do is it invites the reader to recognize it, the ways in which they were en encouraged to unself themselves, to um, destroy their own capacity to be, and to destroy their own sense of a right to be, and to identify it, and then to start building a self back from scratch. Um, so that's the advice that I would give you to do. Is it narcissistic or codependent? You've only given me two options here, mate. Behavior to project one's needs onto another person. Um, well, it's not necessarily either to project your needs onto another person. Let's have a little look at this um, because um, At this properly. Okay, Freudian defense mechanisms in modern social psychology. So this is an example of a defense mechanism. And it's actually everybody talks projection, but there's there are other um defense mechanisms that's there's quite it's quite important to understand. Hey, that's a useless article. So projection is where you take something in yourself that you can't stand and you don't, that doesn't align with your um, identity and you push it into the other person uh, or something, something that you just find unacceptable. Yes, obviously people with narcissistic personality disorder are going to do that. But of course, it's a web page that won't let me leave. Spammy, spammy, spam. Why do we, why why do people set up web pages like that? Like, oh, if we don't let people leave, they'll stay and then they'll buy something. No, they won't. They'll just be annoyed. You go, and that's the number one on there. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, so projection is assigning your own unacceptable feelings or qualities onto others. Um, so an example of that given here is feeling attracted to someone other than your spouse and then fearing that your spouse is cheating on you. I would say if you're, if you're, if you're specifically talking about the narcissist codependent relationship, that dynamic, both have very poor ego boundaries and both are suffering from complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, there's the narcissist response, which is hyper yang. It's trying to enforce a false reality onto other people. And then the codependent echo response, as in narcissus and echo from the original Greek myth by Ovid, um, is hyper yin. It's hyper passive. It's like, you give my story to me. You tell me who, who I am both are neurotic uh, one is very one is obviously more damaging than, than than the other but both are very neurotic responses to to the stress childhood stress um and really savage super ego injunctions so both represent poor boundaries now if you're projecting your needs onto another person can you see where the boundaries are bad so there's a port there's two major bad boundaries here one is my internal boundaries are bad because I haven't recognized in myself, I failed to recognize in myself that I have an unacceptable need or a need that I don't really like, that doesn't say anything good about me. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't really align with my self image. So I'm suppressing it. And then I'm gonna project it outward onto somebody else. So that, so number one bad boundary is internally, I should have recognized that and dealt with it either through conversation with myself or go to therapy. Second bad boundary is, I'm now using the other person as a receptacle for my needs. And you'd say, well, that's purely narcissistic. A codependent would never do that. Well, that's not true because well, from Freud to Jung, in order to, to use Jungian metaphors, so we're still in the field of psychoanalytic theory, but Jung is pretty different to Freud, but he's useful here because you still have to be very shadow possessed to be a narcissist or to be a codependent. So like codependents are not more evolved or enlightened or more, um, what would Jung say? Oh God, individuated. They're not, they're not more individuated than narcissists are. To be a codependent, you also have to live uh, possessed by shadow and you have to, um, you have to repress a lot of your own drives to stay there, which was another one of the defense mechanisms that I wanted to cover. Everybody talks projection, but we need to look at a couple of other ones. So let's also look, uh, because it's relevant to the conversation about narcissists and codependence, defense mechanism, denial, denying that something exists. Well, codependence, obviously the core of the narcissistic personality disorder is one huge denial. It's one big no to reality. It's one big and perpetual no to reality, but a codependent is also in denial because a codependent lives in denial of their own needs. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. Uh, I don't have drives. I don't have ambitions. I'm just a giver. I'm just a natural born giver. I'm just a really good Buddhist. I'm a really good Christian. I'm really whatever bullshit narrative they can come up with. It's still denying that something exists. Uh, the example given here is uh, being the victim of violent crime, yet denying that the incident occurred. Okay, that's not an amazing example, but it's an example. Um, this is I'm on verywellmind.com, which is is okay. It's 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 not like the most intellectually rigorous, but it has it has it has good good articles, Re readable articles, readable articles that are not based in nonsense um, by qualified clinicians. So denial is an important one. Repression, you want to talk projection. We shouldn't talk about projection without talking about repression because you can't project without denial. That's another defense mechanism. You can't project without repression. So unconsciously keeping unpleasant information from your conscious mind. What's the unpleasant information? You don't love your partner like that. You don't want to do the things that they want to do. In many ways, your narcissistic partner, sticking to the codependent narcissist dynamic, disgusts you, repels you, you find them morally abhorrent, but to keep the relationship going and keep the peace and keep playing the codependent dance, you unconsciously keep unpleasant information from your conscious mind and that will lead to 
another defense mechanism i'm going to do two more you need to know these and then i'll stop sublimation converting unacceptable impulses into more acceptable outlets i claim as a recovering not recovered recovering codependent that we have a lot of unacceptable impulses that we push into acceptable outlets so the example given here being upset with your spouse but going for a walk instead of fighting yeah that's a pretty good example of what a codependent would do all your rage all your anger all of your emotions i'm saying your i mean ones but one sounds a bit arcane any uh, uh codependent excuse me i have to plug this in uh, um is is going to be in denial of their anger and of their uh, their rage because if they if they embrace their rage and they integrated thank you they integrated their rage again the narcissist codependent dance would end and then you wouldn't be able to fulfill your childhood script you would just you would you would leave you just say i'm not doing this anymore i'm not you know i am actually repulsed by you i'm actually very very angry with you and i'm responding to my anger by sublimating it into submissive behaviors and then you end up with typically a very very um, um, resentful codependent, which is perfectly normal. Last one. I'm giving you these because you need to understand them. Everybody talks projection, but there's a lot of other defense mechanisms that are very important to understand. It's called reaction formation, reaction formation. Please listen. It's where you replace an unwanted impulse with its opposite in order for a codependent narcissistic relationship to take place and continue despite all of the abuse and all of the abandonment and all of the pain, you must be an expert at these defense mechanisms. So you say like, oh, the narcissist is projecting onto me. Yes, yes, of course, I understand you. And yes, you're right. Of course, that's gonna be one of the first things they do and they're gonna do it a lot. But we need to understand our defense mechanisms so that we can leave. Reaction formation, replacing an unwanted impulse with its opposite, the example given here being sad about a recent breakup, but acting happy about it. How perfectly codependent is that? I'm going to slap a happy face on this one, even though I'm devastated. I'm not going to go to therapy. I'm not going to tell people I'm upset. I'm not going to ask for help because I don't want to impose. I don't want to waste the therapist's time. You know, therapists, they can deal with people with real problems, not like my heartache. And probably if you're a diet in the world uh, codependent like me, you've probably had those thoughts. I don't want to waste the therapist's time. They should be talking to people with real problems, not my bullshit problems like this. So a reaction formation is replacing an unwanted impulse with its exact opposite. Feeling sad and acting happy is a very, very good example. I'll take a couple more questions and then I should wrap it up because I'm only supposed to be on for half an hour and it's already 28 minutes. This is an outrage. When I'm speaking, I expect time itself to stop. Who do I complain to? I demand to see the manager of this simulation immediately. What do you guys think of the simulation? Isn't it a bit crap? Like season 11 of the simulation sucks. It's, it, they've, they've, they've jumped the shark. They've jumped. I don't, I'm not buying the storylines. I'm not invested in, in any of the characters. And I'm like, you know what I'm doing? It's like when you watch a TV show and you're like, well, I've watched eight seasons. Let's just, ugh. like Game of Thrones, the way they ruined Game of Thrones in the last season. They made Tyrion a moron. I was like, what What am I watching? The whole point of this character is that he's, he's, he's uh, physically impaired, but he's got a brilliant mind. And that's his superpower. And now he's just a cowardly moron and physically impaired. Great, thank you, you ruined Tyrion. Made no sense. That's how I feel about this simulation that we're living right now. I'm not impressed. Heather Gum echoes my sentiment I, i'm going to say it through to the end like because it could get better like if we give enough negative feedback and we're like come on we've already done this war we've already done that war what are you like what are we doing here it's like they're just taking chunks of they've run out of ideas it's like pop music they just take hits from the 80s and then put some auto tune over it and then some crappy has been drug addict to mumble rap over it bloody awful They brought in the B team of writers in the last decade. I agree. I agree. Just a bunch of useless. They, they lack experience. They, they they don't care about writing in Hollywood anymore. 
they want like big explosion, big spectacle. People are morons. They're just going to watch for the big. No, no. I'm going through Breaking Bad right now, which I denied for years. And then I watched Better Call Saul. And I love that. So I was like, oh, I'll watch Breaking Bad. And I have a little bit of time at the moment to watch TV, which is great. Breaking Bad's brilliant. Characterization. It's not like explosions and killing people all the time. I want to know the people that I'm watching. Stuff happens to people and you learn more about no characterization. That's anyway. Let's ask a question that's got something to do with inner critics, Pete Walker, narcissism, or the terrible state of writing in this simulation. Do you recommend your book, Cult of One, unreservedly brilliant uh, Dostoevsky levels of just page? You read a page, you're like, that's an amazing revelation. I'm going to live by the wisdom of what was written in this paragraph right here on this page. I don't really expect anything else from this book because it's already given me more than it possibly could have. Boom, next page we go again. Another amazing revelation. Brothers Karamazov levels of brilliance. Literary. <laughs> it's as done it. It's, wow, what a great book. What a great writer. Amazing, brilliant, genius. Very good. I like it. Horror show. Do you recommend the book Cult of One as good for an empathy-lacking person if they'll read it? Yes, um, it cures everything. If you have, like, sore knees, you can just rub. You just spit on the book and just rub the cover on your knees, and it's better. Um, wonderful, wonderful, genius, genius, the best, the best, the biggest, written by the author with the biggest, most beautiful brain, getting over the toxic and the critic, a step for me is to joke and mock my old patterning when it comes up and make fun of my old critical self, good, that sounds healthy to me, um, I did a couple of videos under the uh, guidance of Pete Walker via uh, email uh, correspondence, on my Fortress Mental Health Protection channel. So there's a whole Overcome CPTSD course there available for free, for no money, for good karma, for good karma. So if you like it, you sit there and you visualize a very healthy, happy Richard, and then the karmic overlords, they take that visualization and they apply it vigorously to me. They got be happy. Like, thank you very much. It's nice to live a nice, peaceful life full of health and wonder. Um, and it's called Shrinking the Inner Critic, and it has two parts. So for um, Pete Walker, it was uh, your angering, so you actually fight back against the inner critic, so that allows you to express some of that sublimated and repressed anger, and then you nurture. So, so you, um, in place of what the inner critic is telling you is negative, you're like, well, what, what should a child be hearing about themselves? And then you put that in place. So that's there on Fortress Mental Health Protection System. Uh, and those particular, there's like 11 different videos there. It's like a course on overcoming CPTSD. That is, uh, those videos are called, I think they're just called Shrinking the Inner Critic by Pete Walker. What course? Fortress Mental Health Protection System. It's free. Just karma. Just good karma. Richard, you will be happy and rich, Lamau. That's what I tell myself. Good, good. I want to be happy and rich, Lamau. It's like Portuguese for lemon. I want to be happy and rich, Lamau. Olga writing to me in ancient scripts. Spasiba, Tovarish, Olga. Um, Let's take one more question and then and uh, I'm going to speak to Amanda. Remember Amanda, who we had on the channel? If you go to 2014, February 14, Valentine's Day, you can hear me and Amanda doing an interview on my on my YouTube, where she ex she introduces me to the concept of CPTSD and uh, the book. Pete Walker from Surviving to Thriving. You can hear in real time, except it's in the past. It's old time, but real time. Um, Amanda explaining to me, and I'm going to speak to Amanda now, and I'm going to get her on here, and I'm going to interview her again, which is going to be great. Limão. Fanta Limão. Se faz favor. Sexta-feira. Dia do Bebeidereia. And what else was it? Dia do Brincadeira, sexta-feira. 
I was raised in Portugal and they'd have adverts for Kadok. The it's a huge, it was one of the biggest nightclubs in um in, in Europe at the time. And uh, they would have adverts by a guy who sounded like that. Festa de Spuma, Sexta Feira, Kadok. Festa de Spuma is um well it's a party with spuma. What the foam? God, I am losing. I'm losing signal. Ah, so the signal is okay for like half an hour and then it dies. Hmm. Interessante. Okay, I think I. <laughs> Thank you.